their smiling faces, people we haven't seen for a while, and people we see all the time. Welcome. This morning, if you are visiting with us online as a new visitor, just let us know because Horizon donates $25 to Compassion International in your honor. If uh, you will just let us know and we'd love to reach out, hear your story. If you'd like to give to support the work that Horizon is doing, you can do so online at our website at relationshipsnotreligion.com. We have PayPal in there. There's also a box on there. Table. Next week, our December 17th Sunday gathering will be our last in-person gathering for the year. So we will meet here next Sunday, and then the 24th and December 31st, we're going to be online only. So you can come to the center, but it's going to be closed. So you might as well stay in your PJs, stay warm, and drink coffee or hot chocolate. Um, and you can watch the service online. Um, Horizon is Jesus-centered. Everything that we say and do is focused on being with Jesus, becoming like Jesus, and ultimately doing what he did. This year, we're lighting the traditional Advent wreath again today, and we're lighting the second candle, the candle of peace.
Sam, you can go ahead and come on up. Um, you guys went for a treat this morning. My good friend, my mentor, my uh, who I want to be when I grow up, Sam Spadafore, is here this morning. Sam serves on the advisory board here for Horizon, and he's a great help to me as I try to figure out what to do next and when I come up with problems or issues, whether in my own leadership or uh, in situations at church or where I'm like, I don't know where we're going or what to do next. Uh, Sam is very helpful. Uh, Sam served for years as a pastor in Connecticut. Now he works with an organization that teaches people how to talk about their faith in the marketplace. I've gone through their training. It's incredible. Sam is doing great work there. And I'm just so grateful to have Sam. And I just want to say thank you for coming to speak to us. I always enjoy your messages. They always inspire, challenge, and uh, I'm really looking forward to it. And uh, another thing I just want to say about Sam, every Monday, on the dot, I get a text message from Sam and it says, I'm praying for you today. 
And that's such a small thing, but I can't tell you how encouraging it is. How many times I've been at a low moment and I've got that. How many times I've been in a moment where I just felt like giving up and I've got that. And uh, it's amazing how something so small as knowing every Monday, and many of them don't forget about it, and it comes through, he doesn't ever forget it. And it comes through and it encourages and reminds me. So I just want to encourage you, be a Sam for someone. Set a reminder on your phone, choose a day, pray for someone, and just shoot them a text and say, hey, I pray for you, 30 seconds, one minute, I pray for you. It'll change somebody's life. Be a Sam. Sam, let me pray for you, and then let you come to me. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for Sam. Thank you for bringing him into my life. And Lord, thank you for just how he's the right man at the right time uh, for me and our church. And I'm so grateful for him. And so many times he's given me such wisdom. But Lord, I appreciate his humility. He's never interested in himself. He's always interested in others. And God, I hope that one day I can look as much like Jesus as Sam does. And I pray that you will bless him today. And as he speaks, I pray that you will speak through him. That we will be encouraged and inspired and, yes, even challenged as we enter this Advent season together. Pray all these things in the name of Jesus to Christ. Amen. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I have a privilege to be here. I love this church. I love what Alex is doing and who he is. I love to listen to the messages. So I am happy to be here and I'm humbled to be invited. We have lit the second candle today, the candle that represents peace. And so I want to talk to you about the adventure of peace, the advent of peace, and then the adventure that that creates within us, that there is an internal experiment or internal adventure or internal journey of peace that we go on. And then there is this cosmic and external journey of peace. So I want to first look at the connection between peace and Christmas. So we'll be looking at Isaiah chapter 9 and Luke chapter 2. Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase, notice this is going to be a dynamic, growing thing, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. When the Messiah comes at this advent, this great journey of internal and external peace will start and will slowly grow as the kingdom grows. Luke chapter 2, verse 8. And there were shepherds living in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone on them. And they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find the baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a company of the heavenly host appeared to meet with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory, not glory, glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. So there's a great connection between the Advent and peace. Now, I want to talk to you a little bit, sort of uh, to get us started, about the nature of divine peace or the nature of biblical peace. I, I tried to put some peaceful little background on there because for most of us, peace, when we think of peace, we think of peace and quiet. Peace is nothing. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to think of anything. But peace is much more dynamic than that. Or we might just think of peace as the secession of war, as long as there's no big war going on. But this biblical word for peace, shalom in the Old Testament, ibene in the New Testament, means so much more. Peace, shalom, ibene has a wide semantic range, 
stressing various nuances of its basic meaning. It means totality or completeness. Have you ever felt like you're not whole? Wholeness. Um, soundness, both individual and community whole. It means community, it means harmony, tranquility, security, well-being, welfare, friendship, agreement, success, and prosperity. This is a tremendous, full word that means so many things that all of us long for, even if we can't put our fingers on exactly what we're looking for, this is the real peace we desire. Shalom differs from the world peace. Jesus said, my peace I give to you not as the world gives. So it's going to be different than what is accessible by the world. Now when Jesus said this in John 14, this is just before his imprisonment, his capture, and going to the cross. I don't know that the disciples got it right away. It is something that needs to grow in us and needs to be received. It also transcends all understanding. Peace that passes understanding, as it says in the King James Version. This is something that can't be understood. I can experience peace in the midst of situations where I should not have any. It is also dynamic. It grows slowly along with the kingdom, as we saw in Isaiah 9. Shalom finds its greatest expression in eternity. When will we see it? fully complete in eternity. Shalom is rooted in the Godhead. We have the God who is the Father of peace, the Prince of peace, Jesus, and the Spirit of peace. Shalom is a gift. Peace is a gift. Many times in Scripture, it talks about peace as a gift. Jesus said, my peace I give unto you. But it's also a fruit. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit includes peace. Now, fruit is something that is a natural result of time and proper conditions. I love to have a garden. The fruit of that garden takes time and proper conditions. So one thing I don't want you to do is leave her saying, I am determined to be more peaceful. It requires time and the proper conditions. Now, there is an external adventure. We are called to be peacemakers. Jesus said in Matthew 5 9 in the, in the Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. What is the family resemblance? That we are peacemakers. Now, making peace isn't easy. We look at what's going on in the world. We can't even get peace in some of the simplest ways for a week or two. Human effort only goes so far in making peace. And most peacemaking requires Christ-like character. So it cannot be done by just saying most people have selfish motives for why they want peace or where they stand in the peacemaking process. Ego is much more important than the end result, and so peace is not fair. This is why most human eff humanistic efforts at peace fail, because people who don't have peace try to create peace. And they're unable to do so. You can't give away what you don't have. Often we want to be involved in making peace in a global in a global way, but we don't have it here yet. And the egos and the fears creep in and break that peace. Now, as peacemakers, we love I love to solve the situation in the Middle East. I'd love to solve situations with people that I know or they've been fighting for years and generations. Most of us aren't going to have the opportunity to do that. But how do we make peace in our daily lives? 
And remember, we're not just talking about the secession of the argument. We're talking about these wonderful things like harmony, tranquility, security, well-being. One of the things that I experimented with earlier on, and I love doing now, if I'm in a line and someone's fighting with the person behind the counter, and there's all kinds of stress and turmoil, when it's my turn to get up there, I will say something like, in, in light of everything you've gone through, you handled that situation really well. And all of a sudden, the, the level of, uh, of discord comes down. Sometimes just saying nice things to people can start to create an atmosphere of peace. When I first came home from college after my first year there, my father and I used to fight all the time. Every dinner, my mother said, was disrupted because we fought about something. I had an army jacket that had a peace sign on it and an American flag. He did not like that. He wanted that. Gone. I grew up in the 60s and the 70s. He just didn't understand the tip. I don't like this hippie thing you're doing. You can't wear it, take it off. It's mine, I'll wear whatever I want. And so we fought about all kinds of things. When I came home after that first year of college, I had a great appreciation for who my father was, the sacrifices he was making just so I could be there. And so we sat down and we're having dinner and there's no fight going on. So he tries to create one. And he says, so what do you think about this? So what do you think about this? And, it, and I wouldn't fight with him. And at one point he said, how are we going to have a relationship if we can't fight about things? This is what we've always done. And I said, well, let's start a new one. And he shared something else and he knew would get me going. And I said, that, that's a very interesting perspective. I'll need to look into that, but what I, with what I know now, this is where I stand. And the arguments were gone, and there was peace around the table. As we walk into this Advent week of peace, see where you can bring peace. In your own life, in your own family, at work, wherever you go, start the journey of peace. We're called in Romans 12, 18, if it is possible, as much as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. If possible. What does that mean? There are usually at least two people involved in this peace process. If I'm having problems with Alex, I can do what I can do, but it requires peace from him. Now, my dad embraced that peace thing, and so we got along from then on. But he didn't have to. So your abilities are limited. This is not peace at any cost. Compromise, do whatever you need to do for peace. No, there's only so far you can go. But as much as it depends on you, be at peace with everyone. But this starts with this tremendous internal adventure. You can't give away which you don't have. Now we said that peace or shalom or irony is a gift. And that means that God has made it available to us. Somewhere there is peace to be found and experienced and, and this journey to walk one that you may not feel you have it right now. But this peace, this shalom, this irony is also a fruit. And as we said, fruit requires time. Sometimes we need to be patient with ourselves. Sometimes we need to be patient with others. And the right conditions. When I was younger there in the story I told you before, on a Saturday afternoon after lunch, and we growing up with a family business, we worked until lunch on Saturday. But on a Saturday afternoon after lunch, my father said, I want you and your brother to go downstairs and clean the entire basement. And I, we, I started to respond. We, we worked till noon, we had lunch, it's over, this is my time. I need you to go downstairs and clean the basement. I'm not cleaning the entire basement, it'll take forever. Now, I hadn't been down there in a long time, it was almost spotless. But I once again argued with him, no, there's no way I'm gonna do that. I've worked enough, I've done enough, you always want my time. All right, well then, all you need to do is you and your brother need to 
to get down there and move the two boxes that are down there. And I could tell my dad was very frustrated. I don't want to move the boxes. What's the big deal? Nobody sees them. Move the two boxes. I knew now I had pushed a little too far. My brother and I walked downstairs and each of us grabbed one of these big boxes. As we moved the boxes behind them, were brand new bicycles for us. I just needed to be in agreement with my father to get the gift. It was there, and I'm surprised <laughs> that it isn't still there, that he didn't just say, fine, you don't want to clean the basement? Forget it. Now these were brand new, blue bicycles with sissy bars and banana seeds. But some of you may have no idea what that means, but if you were alive back in the 70s, this was cool. It was, they were three speed bikes, not just one, three speed. Sometimes to experience peace and to receive the gifts that God has given us, or anybody gives us, we need presence, obedience, and alignment. You gotta be there. We gotta spend time with God to receive that peace and for it to grow with us. There are times we need to obey. All of us probably can relate to the experience when you're about to do something or say something and you get that little tap on the shoulder by the Holy Spirit. No, nope, don't go there. And often we don't. And sometimes, like a little child, we look up, kind of think, what are you going to do about it? And we go on to do it anyway. And then look back to make sure lightning's not coming. We need presence, we need to spend time with the Lord, we need to obey when He speaks to us, and we need to align ourselves with His will. And when we do that, we can see the increase of the experience of peace in our lives. When I think about that, I think about Psalm 23, 5. That He sets a table for me in the presence of my enemies. I love this artwork except for the fact that here the snake is dead. Our enemies are still very much alive, are they not? But think about what this verse says. In the presence of my enemies, when my enemy is there or surrounding me, God sets a table for me. Have you ever had a situation where you're like, I'm just so aggravated I can't eat? Now, it's hard to believe, but I have had that same situation. I've worked my way through some of them, you can tell. When we were first married and had our first child, my brother came up to visit us. Uh, he lived in New Jersey, I lived up in Connecticut. And we've got this little baby with us, and he wants to, since he's in Connecticut, he's in New England, he wants to get lobster. Where can we get lobster? Well, we're a young married couple in ministry with a little baby. I don't know where you can get lobster. I don't frequent those kind of places. So we went to one restaurant. They didn't have it. We went to another and they didn't have it. We were seated in one and they said, well, we have it, but we don't have it today. And so we were heading to another place and we got there and there they didn't have it either. So, like, it's one something Baby's crying. I don't know what we're doing. We got to eat. So my, we, we go in. We, we sit down. My brother says, well, there's no lobster here, so I'm going to get this. What are you going to eat? And my family reminds me of this all the time. I said, I'm not even hungry anymore. I was just too upset to eat. There's just too much going on. But here in this time, we are told that we can be surrounded by our enemies and God can set a table for us and we can sit with him and we can be nourished in the midst of those situations. See, we think peace is God getting rid of all of our enemies. God said, I've got a peace that passes all understanding. You can be surrounded by your enemies and you and I can sit and chill and I can just bring that level down and you can experience my peace. So, in conclusion, with the advent, with the coming of Jesus, 
When God gave us Jesus, the Prince of Peace, he gave us the power to experience internal peace that can't be described and the potential to create external peace, starting in our families and moving out from there into the world. Maybe, maybe even on a grand scale. What I want to challenge you to do is to look at internal and external peace, not only as something to celebrate for Advent, but as an adventure, a journey to continue to move forward in. As you move through the rest of this year, through this very busy season, and into next year, consider yourself on a journey to have peace growing within you and peace spread behind you to everyone around you. See what you can do. Unpack that phrase. Unpack this concept. Explore the growth of peace in your own life and in the lives of those around you.